without further ado, um, I would like to give a very big warm welcome to uh, Rick Rogers uh, of Big History Leeds, talking about what is Big History. <coughs> genuinely interested in stuff um, and will be interesting by turn. So I'm a fourth question and answer at the end of this. That's not funny. <coughs> okay. What I'm going to talk about is big history. Now big history sounds very, very straightforward. It sounds like history, only bigger. Like <laughs> normal history, but just like massive. Well it isn't. It's different. It's a slightly different animal and that's the whole point of it. And the, later on I'll come to why is important and why it's useful socially, educationally, and so on. But we'll start. There we go. I put this up because this is big geography. Just trying to get your head around it. This is, that's big geography. That's Google Earth. I'm sure you've seen Google Earth. If you go far from Google Earth, what you get is the Earth. You recognise that. <coughs> the interesting thing about um, big geography is it's what you can't see because of the scale. If you look at the world from that distance, although they've put on some lights with a big conurbation and somebody's drawn in some big yellow lines, which I'm sure you can't see them from space, but anyway, you can't see the rivers, can you? Yeah. But isn't, isn't our rivers quite a key part of geography? My son's doing GCSE geography at the moment, he's always going on about rivers, rivers this, rivers that, it's got lakes this, whatever. But you can't see the rivers. So, is that really big geography? Well, yes, it is. But you can't see the detail, and that's the difference. And this is what you can get your head around with the history. The detail disappears, so you have to replace it with something else. Because if you imagine you have the history of, say, Kirk's Labby, and you extrapolate that detail into the whole history of the world and the universe, that's an awful lot of stuff to get in. So the big history has to lose some detail to retain its coherence. In the river scale, when we go right down in our big geography analogy, is this. Now, you look at that and think, well, that's um, a recycling bin. That's a bin I used to put my stuff in about 20 odd years ago. It wasn't they were known, there was a big metal thing there. It was a bin, it's the same place. And on Google Earth, I went right down, I had a little look, oh, look at that, I should live there. And that's the bone, there was a bin there, and my flat was actually facing on the ground floor that little bit of bin. And if you look at that bin and you ask a big question about plate tectonics, how are you going to answer the question if you've got the big picture? How are you going to say, well, you know what, continental drift, yeah, it's not there, is it? So by the same token that, that big geography loses the detail, little geography doesn't give you enough to answer some important questions. And so what we do is we move between the two extremes along a line of scale. And scale switching is something to get your head around. If you get your own geography, <coughs> you get big history. Seemingly, so it doesn't, doesn't really. It just feels like it does. And if you 
take the plus and the minus from Google Maps, you can use those in your imagination to go in and to come out. And the further in you go, the more detail you see, and the further out you go, the less detail you see, but you get a bigger picture of our past and our present, possibly our future, and so on. So that's the big picture, and that's big history. But not in its entirety. What is time? I like this question, and I'm not sure I know the answer to it. This is talk about fourth dimension. People look at their watches as though somehow it's kind of some set in stone thing. Time is a kind of construct that we have that is there and is true. But like government or I don't know, homework, that's my kids. What is time? I tend to think of time as being a measurement. A measurement of time? No. A measurement of the movement of bodies in space. I'm not saying this is right, it's an interpretation. The movement of bodies in space. If you believe in the Big Bang Theory, the universe started with an intensely small bit of thing, it went boom, and we are moving away from the center point. And as we move, we spin, and we orbit, and the sun moves, and our galaxy twists and turns, and all sorts of funky things. So in relation to that central point, we are never in the same place twice. Although we go around the sun, the sun never stays either, so we're moving in effect all the time. We're in a different place every split second, every second I'm talking, we are in a different place in space. And that's how I get my head around time. I don't know if that's right. I'm sure there'll be any number of people telling us wrong, but that's what it seems to me that time is. And that means but it can never, never go back, never go forward. The Chinese have an interesting view of time. The Chinese think that time is circular. Time is just a circular and circle. Hmm. Interpretation. I'm always amazed how big the sun is. I think that's, I don't, that's a, that's a scale. I think maybe brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Is that about right, I think? No? Because you see, you see different versions there, and if you go on the internet, you see all solar systems, can be quite small, about the size of Jupiter, sometimes it's absolutely incredibly massive, and all kinds of really tiny, and that's kind of like the middle. So that's something else I'm not quite sure of. How big is the sun? Well, it's big. It's bigger than me. What time do you think they are? This, this <laughs> but you're all smart, you know the answer to this. What year, what year is it? It's 2016. He's an idiot. He doesn't know what year it is. He's put all these ridiculous answers and then we're supposed to pick out the fifth one, aren't we? And say it's 2016. Which you won't fall for, will you? I guess. Because you figured it out, haven't you? But this kind of under underlines the kind of the arbitrary nature of our time and what time is. Because we'll just say, oh, it's 2016. Yeah. I'm going to go then. So if you're Jewish, it's 5776. So I'm going to get that. 2016 is from the birth of Christ. Thank you. <laughs> and if the 438, if you're Muslim, uh, 2559, I think it's Buddhist. The murky is Hindu. It's complicated. I'm just saying, oh, no. when I put this together, going on the internet and uh, Trying to work out what year it was in here. Oh, blind, I have no idea. It's like eons and epochs and different. Oh, it's just incredible. <laughs> then 545 is Sikh. And that's data from the birth of the first uh, guru. <laughs> yes, you're right. 260 is, is from the birth of our Lord. Interesting aside, our years are ordinal numbers. Some people don't know. So this year is not the year 2016. It is the 2016 year. And you may think, well, what's the matter? What's the matter? Anybody remember the um, celebration? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> in the end of 1999 year. 999 is not a thousand years, not a millennium, is it? It was a year early. It was, you know, it was a triumph of ignorance. You don't celebrate the new year at 11 o'clock or 11 1 on New Year's Eve, do you? You wait till the end of the 24th hour of the 31st of December, and then we have it. But for millennium now, forget that, we'll do a year early. Because the numbers change. People think, oh yeah, it's their odd numbers, but they're cardinal numbers, not odd numbers. I had, I had two celebrations, I had a nice man, 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 I no structure to it, and in a sense, Time is really important to all of us. It structures our lives, doesn't it? The fact that you all graciously turned up at 10 o'clock this morning to listen to this is about time and your appreciation of time, your understanding of how time works, like him as well, and Patrick situation, not Chris with it, and so on. It's very important. Now, the organisation of time is very important. How it's labelled is purely, it's not quite arbitrary, but almost. We like numbers, so 31st of December, what's the fourth day today? 15th, 16th of December. Mm -hmm. But if we just did numbers, we like epochs, ages, something that defines period. Oh, that was that period when these things were happening and this was going on. There's certain big history movements in all over the world. One of my favourites is a, a, um, it's a website and institution in California called Big History for Us All, run by a man called Ross Dunn, who is a, is a lovely chap, a friend of mine. And on his, he's got nine epochs. He's divided times into nine epochs. Now, the Dutch have a similar system, they have 11 epochs. I've never worked out why the Dutch have 11 epochs, but the Americans only need nine. But here's the interesting thing, the Scots have 13. Everybody from Scotland, the enlightenment world, the Scots have 13 epochs. It's not how you see it, but epochs are very useful. They define, the Renaissance defines me, isn't it? You know, oh, I say, I say, Renaissance, I think this. Leonardo da Vinci, blah, 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 Reformation, and so on. So we have these epochs, and what we look at in these epochs is change. History is change. If it was simply a slice of pie, this would like, and what? What does it mean? What does it mean that the Romans had very nice central heating in some of their houses? Well, We can say things like, that's like us. I thought it was not dissimilar to the Romans. And yet the Saxons who came after the Romans to Britain, they didn't have underfloor central heating. That's a comparison, it's an appreciation of change and history. It's change, whether you do it at a minute level, whether you do it at a big level, what we're interested in is how things have changed. Where does change come from? Why did it happen? What was it like then? What about now? Change. And to understand that, we need to organise the past with numbers and epochs so we can see the trends and how the trends work. And hopefully, we can see how the trends will go in the future. And that's something else the big history is quite interested in. Where are we going with this? Where are we going with voting? Or the X Factor. Is that how we decide on the policy in 20 years on Saturday Night Live and Death? You know, normal Brexit votes crossing a bit of paper, it'll all be on television on your mobile phones. Yes. Hang in. Or whatever, whatever the thing is. But it's an interesting thing, the future is a big part of big history, which is a part of my life. Because the future sounds like a graduate. But there are trends we can see going.
change it to okay. This um, is a document I've been I've used for years. I used to be a teacher, by the way, from Leeds. I've now been a British teacher. But uh, I used to use this for my kids. This is a fiber box, because I thought now was a bit much, and you know, we don't need five really. It's only this amount of time as well. If you go out to the big bang from the, the first line, it's the smidgen. It's like the whole, it's like the whole thing if the world was a clock, it was dead. When would man appear, he'd appear like just before me. It's a very small slice of the history. And people who are into astronomy like the history, because we've learned to astronomy, because most of our history, or our past, or the past, is astronomy. This is us. And that's what it's fine. And it's basically based on, basically based on, sorry, it's based on the groups in which we live. We all live in groups. It's one of the things about human beings. We all live in some form of group. Um, this is a group today. You are in a group now. Aren't you? you will go home. You will have families that you live with. They are your group. You are connected to people. You are to your neighbours and your community and so on. And our groups over time have got bigger. We've got more out turn as we've gone on in our history. For obvious reasons, cavemen didn't have smartphones and the internet. They didn't know about Australia. Some of them didn't know about being over here, depending on where you were looking what you did. And for most of human history, we're in the first bit. And all we do is we travel around, usually, because we're very lucky, looking for the things that we need to keep us alive. And that again is an interesting comparison with what we do now. We are free from that burden, are we not? We go foraging in the supermarket. Then. It's really easy, isn't it? It's much easier to catch the things in the forest, I think. <laughs> Having never caught a thing in a forest in my life. <coughs> but you know, this is what we have to do every day. They had to find what they needed to survive. And they had to live in very small groups because the opportunity for finding these things was not enough to sustain a larger group. What did they think about survival? Very simple life. Some historians have argued that this was the golden age of being human beings. Because there was no stress, no jobs, no bureaucracy, no pressure to wear this and do that. Sorry? No tax. No tax, exactly. All the things that irk you about the modern world. No, I just think it's not nice. Except the fact you were liable to die before you were 30, and you were liable to get in by something nasty. <laughs> so, you know, there's a payoff, so there's always a payoff in life. Whenever you think, you know, come down from really times you came in, yeah, but when you're 30, you're going to get quite tired. Okay, well, that's right. If you were lucky enough in those days to live next to <coughs> a big river full of fish, Forest with deer and animals and fruit and so on. We've actually quite a nice life, I would think, in terms of just get up in the morning, get your food, take about an hour, the rest of the day, and just play and, you know, generally have a nice time until the tiger arrived in. <laughs> then move further. Now then, what happens? Something happens in our history. I'm not quite sure why. It's quite chicken egg, this. But we start to get bigger groups. And one of the obvious reasons is that there's enough food to feed a larger group. The food to feed a larger group comes to a larger. And then, because there's a larger group, we need more food. And it's that sort of chicken and egg thing, and then you just really come up with an answer. It's a very interesting debate. But we suddenly stop running around, and we start altering our environment. Trials. 
and try and root it different because they are made up of multiple family groups. And that might create some bit more conflict perhaps. How we organise ourselves? Well, we have to defer somebody in hierarchy who might not know. In the, in the, in the band, you know everybody intimately. If the old fella says, don't do that, you think, oh, you've been alive, I'm going to do my tie game, which is like, I will listen to you, maybe I'll be as old as you, and won't get by a tiger. <coughs> Once you remain in one place, something changes, it's very important in human history. And that's this. If you move around, you have no memory aid to, to carry your past in your head. Really, you carry it all in here. And often you look to the older person. This is the greatest thing about memory is that how we depend on other people for our memories. Memory is a group activity. So older people in our families are very important. Partners are very important to remember things that you will forget. So the bands are very tenuous hold on the past. Often people fill in the gaps. They've got a bit of rotters, he's building gaps a lot. There's some very interesting stuff that he kind of made up. A little. In the tribes, you stay in one place and you don't move. And you're born in the place, and you live in the place, and you die in the place. You're looking at the same thing. And that reminds you. The other question is, what do you do with the dead? Some cultures burn the dead. We do that. Many cultures bury the dead. If you bury the dead, where do you bury them? Well, you don't want to bury them outside the door, do you? You want to bury them somewhere where you don't, you're not going to disturb them, where there's, there's some sort of peace where you can maybe go and visit where they're buried and remember. Somebody else dies, you put them in the oh, minute. Where do we put the other time? Um, oh, he's there, isn't he? <coughs> How do you know that? Because we left the stone there to mark it, so we don't dig up the first person, we put the second person, we put the next one, and so on. And before you know, we've got a graveyard. And graveyards are fantastic evidence of the past. And the little kids say, Granddad, why is that stone there? Because that's where so and so were, and they were this and this, and they were related to them, and they're very old now, you know. And all of a sudden, you've got history. You've got history, initially, of course, spoken and remembered. But you have memory aids, you have a sense of your past. And there's something here that we call the cognitive or the symbolic revolution where we suddenly become aware of our own existence. And that's something that is unique to human beings. We know we are here, do we not? And we understand the context of our existence. Animals don't tend to, they just go on emotion or intu intuition or uh, instinct. But we are aware of the context of our existence, and that happens somewhere here. And we start speaking language, then we start writing it down, it's even more complicated that later on. The food thing goes on, we get more and more food, and we start to get more organised. Because really the question of food is if you make X amount and you need a bit less for your tribe, what do you do with the rest of it? <coughs> Tribe over the hill, and they're making so you've got more stuff of one thing, and they've got more stuff of another thing, and it makes sense, is it not, to swap things with them? I mean, even, even go back to band, there are, we can see in Australia, there are, there's evidence of trading routes between the Aboriginal tribes, even in this period. So people are very kind of in tune with this benefit of swapping stuff. When we get into this kingdoms thing, initially city states in what is now Iraq and Syria, we start to get very, very big groups of people, tens of thousands, living together, swapping like mad. And it gets very, very complicated. And how do you keep track of who's swapping what? And what part of leaders? Because what do they do? They lead. If you leave, you don't make anything. If you don't make anything, how are you going to 
means what they need for somebody to survive. So where are your clothes going to come from? Where's your food going to come from? You cannot have people in a society who don't make something. And there's a bit of proof of people in this room. Some of you will have earned your living making something. Tangible. Many of you will. I suspect. I don't know. I've made my living talking about this stuff. You straight up. So what do you do? Well, you have to write stuff down. You have to get tablets of clay and put marks on it. It means something. And who knows it means something? I know it means something. We all know it means something. And we can work it out. And we start to equate these marks with our language and we get writing. Because writing is very important to keep track of all the stuff that we make. The other thing we invent is new marvel. This one won't be doing, she's with kids. Let's get this out. And they'll say, <laughs> Can I have that, sir? No, you can't. But I know, you, you've got some of these, I know, I know, it's not going to work for you. But I asked them, What is this? It's money. What's it worth? £20. Why is it there? Because you can go and buy stuff with it. Tokens of value, universally accepted. Because money's only as only as worth what you think it's worth. This one gets this whole kind of thing that our, our lives are based on the abstract thoughts. They're based on fantasies that we choose to believe in. And money is the greatest fantasy. It doesn't actually have any value. Only in your head. How scary is that? That was terrible. It only has value in your head. If you believe it has value, it has value. If you go into a coffee house and have a coffee, please, uh, two pounds fifty, so there you go, thank you very much. You accept that that's what it's worth, and that's what you'll pay. The person taking your money accepts that. It's a, a great act of trust between the two of you and the organisations that you represent or you or whatever. Money is simply a way of easing trade. In this period. So all these things we take for granted have a reason. A very practical reason. Because we start to rely on people to make our stuff, we get specialism. In a way we haven't really had before. Specialism we take for granted. What do you do? I'm a shoemaker. Oh wow, skilled person. What do you do? I'm a lawyer. Think, oh wow, educated. You know, that law. Specialists. Who work for tokens. Not for stuff. And of course, we get this kingdom idea one person's in charge, not the myth that this person was given the crown because God willed it. Maybe he does, I don't know. We believe in it. We have believed in it. Who believed that Elizabeth has been queen because God willed it? I don't know. Some people might have. And then we get a bit more familiar to us. We start to build empires, we take over other groups because they have something we want. There's another myth about empires, and Mr. Gove will tell you that we conquer the world because we'll be nice to people. We want to give them stuff. Nice stuff like Christianity and civilization. And in return, they give us other stuff like uh, tea, gold, and diamonds, and stuff like that. Well, any of it's fair trade, isn't it? Surely. We did this because we were the first people to realise that making stuff by hand was a bit slow. And if you got a machine to make it, it was so much better. So much quicker. More efficient. You could charge less, sell more, make loads of money. And the reason this country is so wealthy, as you will know, is because of this, this shift of making stuff. And Marx would say this is the most important strand here of how we make stuff. That's the key to history. Other people disagree. But it's certainly very important in the story of Britain, and the story of Leeds as well, I'll come to in a minute. Um, how we make stuff here important. This, this change the way we make stuff. And it does very important the groups that we live in. Also, we get this. You see, in the Age of Kingdoms, 
people who did thinking, there were other people. Most people didn't think, did they? Most people just did. And they worked. Really. Most people, like my family, three or four generations ago, what did they do? Maybe five or six generations ago. Worked on farms, worked on fishing industry, they got what they did. Revolution working class. What about our churches, funnily enough, in this country? Abroad as well, to an extent. It's revolution of education. It's a very modern phenomenon to have a society, most of which is educated to a certain degree. It's a very modern phenomenon. We take for granted. I mean, I take it for granted while in school, because I guess you have. That you've not been wrong. And this means something to you. Okay. Very modern. And then we get the modern era, post Second World War, the era of big organisations, the United Nations, European Union, big um, people, mass production, even without people, which is very scary. I went to, uh, when I was a teacher, I used to go and visit the kids on work experience when they were in year 10, year 11, so I said, year 10. And uh, I'm going to a bottling plant in um, Brownwood. You know, J2O's, the mm -hmm. sort of mango and apple thing in the bottle. The bottle in, 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 uh, in Brownwood. And I walked through this factory, and there was nobody there. Literally, a massive, great building. There was not a human being in sight. There was somebody in the office at that, that was it. Oh, this is crazy. But I guess automation. And the internet, internet, internet revolution, information revolution, very important. We you know the internet has changed the way we think about things and the way that society works and groups interact and so on. Okay, that's the history of mankind in 10 minutes. But I'm going to do a Shakespeare, because that's the whole Shakespeare bit now. <laughs> so, why? Because this is the question, actually. You, you, oh, that's kind of like, you can't do that. It's well, right. But why is it important to do that? And that's, that's the thing. Than really I'm getting to. Big history forces you to do certain things in certain ways. And this is why it's important. I'm just going to go through these, these three points I'm going to make for you. And the first one is a real good bear of mine. Hi. On the board, there are three things singular particulars, unitary, solitary phenomena. One thing. One thing. And from that one thing, people make very, very generalised statements about something and have a, a very strong opinions. For example, I'm going to work from this end that way. That guy, that's Tim Phipps. You know who Tim Phipps is? He's named Peter Croydon. Now, I've got no beef with Tim Phipps particularly. He just named Peter Croydon. But what he did say in the recent grammar school debate is this He said, I went to a grammar school. It didn't do me any harm. I'm quite happy to believe that. I'm not, you know, I would never contest that. I'm sure he did good. I'm sure he's very successful. He's totally happy. Not a problem with that. However, this was his rationale for supporting the Grand School Initiative. Now, I have no beef one way or another with Grand School Initiative, particularly. But I'm interested in the fact that he argues. That from his singular particular case, we can extrapolate that micro to have a macro policy in this country for grammar schools. And that worries me slightly. The second one is even more um, <coughs> alarming if you take it to a logical extent. That lady's called Judy McEnany. She's an American lady. I've met her, I've met her husband Larry. She's a lovely lady. 20 years ago, she was diagnosed with cancer, serious cancer, stage four cancer. They said, you probably have a few weeks left before you're going to die. Now that's quite scary. I'm sure we know people who've been in that situation. It's very, what's new to hear? And she heard that and she said, right, 
What do I do? And someone says, well, you should go on microbiotic. You should eat brown rice, vegetable, it's in season, um, beans, seaweed. Really look after yourself. And she did. And she's still alive. 20 years later. It's a nice story. Sorry? How she got your husband? Oh, he's, he's very nice. <laughs> 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 I went on a course with a man a few years ago, and he, he did the exercise a bit. He did like that sort of Japanese exercise stuff. Now, if we take this Tim Phipps in the model, what I'm saying to you is really, it worked for her. So anybody you know has cancer, forget going to affects the wound, forget chemotherapy, forget radiotherapy, don't look at the gamma knife, you know the doctors, eat brown rice. That is government policy. <laughs> now if you went in the class one and said that, what would happen? And yet the model is exactly the same. You wouldn't, would you? You would go to the doctor, you would go to the chemotherapy, and you would do everything you can. And then of course we have this one. The external Jew. I think we've seen the external Jew. It's a, a particularly vile documentary film. I say documentary film. It's horrible. It is how the Jews are like rats and how they hide and they hide amongst you. And some of them actually look like people, but they're not people, they're rats, you know. And who doesn't live? near to a community that's isolated, that's quite insular perhaps, for whatever reason. And how many of us don't know a person of that community who perhaps we don't particularly think is a very worthwhile person? Possibly. And you extrapolate from that, Jews are bad people, Jews are inhuman, and it gets it becomes snowballing, and then we tolerate some things we know, the Holocaust, didn't happen because some nasty people did some nasty things. It happened because a lot of people really didn't take the time to challenge this whole propaganda view of a set of people. And we where that ended, we you know it's awful. But it was this model of thinking that caused it. It was singular, particular, and the global view. I know about yours. And that's why people ignore what was going on in Nazi Germany. And in Europe as well, but obviously in Germany. In France and Russia and so on. The reason I, one of the key things is this, I'm going to talk about Brexit for a second, but this is a brilliant example of this. I was in a pub with two friends. I wasn't really in this conversation. They were talking, one was for Remain, one was for Brexit. And the guy from Remain runs a business. And he was saying, yeah, the economy department's of this. And blah, and he's let out these trade things and so on and so forth. And my other friend, who, um, he said, yeah, but I read in the newspaper that an Albanian woman left her kids at customs and then she disappeared. And I'm paying for those children. That's very generous of you. No. <laughs> and then my friend countered with some more you know, economic arguments. And my friend said, yeah, but this woman's husband owns two nightclubs in Albania. And I was like, I can't believe I'm listening to this. Because again, he was taking a single particular and from it constructing a global view. And the mailing argument from my friend who owns a business was very clear. Albania is not in the European Union. And he still wouldn't accept it. Because he was single particular, he was stuck on this whole idea. He could actually you know, broaden the debate out, and there were certainly arguments on both sides. But he wasn't going there, he was kind of fixated on this thing of in the face. Singular particular. Very dangerous. So, big history. You have to make generalizations. When you're a kid, if your parents say to you, don't make generalizations, you come in here with your sweeping generalizations about whatever, or you know, all Germans and Nazis, or whatever you might say, and you talk about. You can't do big history without making a generalization. You can't, it doesn't work. Because there's not enough detail for you not to. Now, the thing about generalizations is they're always slightly inaccurate.
use their generalisation. They are flawed. We accept their flaw. They're not the truth. They're simply a way of dealing with all this material. You have to check them and recheck them, measure them against the evidence, reformulate them, and so on. And then you come to a better understanding of whatever it is you're talking about. This is not a big issue, this is life in general. If you accept something to be true, it's dangerous. In big history, you have to keep reforming and reforming. Everything you read, everything you look at, changes your view of the big picture. Like that. What does that do? He's a dude, he's brilliant. He was a scientist, he said, you know what, if you do experiments over and over again in science, the results will change. Which I thought was amazing. I thought, no, science is not science. If you do X experiment with your little plasma, your double paper and whatnot, then it's almost set, isn't it? That's the whole thing about science. If it's not, no, 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 it's changing. Ooh, does it? Yeah. It's called paradigm shift. You have to rewrite, based on new experience, what your idea was about Falling by the water, 100 degrees centigrade. Have you ever walked through that? Is that true? No. No, it isn't, is it? That's the thing. This is what I mean. It's a generalization. I mean, it works. And if you say it's okay, it's fine. It's a generalization. But it's not absolute true. It's not. And you have to understand that in this different kind of change. And that's a great way of thinking about it. Power context. We have three experts. These are not just a bit flush off about the internet. Expert A in big history. Expert B is a, a surgeon who's really into um, bladders. He's a really he's a big bladder man, he knows everything about bladders. Everything you want to know about bladders, he's got it. Expert C, he's really into J.S. Bach. And he's, really, he's, really, he's done loads of work on Bach's uh, keyboard music and how it's how it impacted on his contemporaries in terms of the tonal system and so on. Now, these two people in a room, what's the conversation like? <laughs> Painful! Oh, because what can, there's no... He comes in with a bit of, you know, ooh, bladder control, you see, it's bad, it's good news. And he says, so, yeah, but J.S. Barr, you see, he wrote about 48 poems and fugues. It's like to do with bladders, nothing at all. Big history lady comes in, and she says, hello. And, uh, Talks to the bladder man, he says, Oh, bladder's a jar, isn't it? Surgeons, yeah, surgeons. I know about surgeons. This is um, developed, isn't it, from barber surgeons in the Middle Ages. Oh, yeah, we had a conversation. And he talked about that. Oh, yeah, bar. Yes, the Baroque, the name of the Baroque, sort of age of reason, kind of new thinking. Very much part of that kind of real kind of reworking of thought. She didn't talk to anybody about anything. She's not no detail. She can't go into the, the final points of, you know, the prostate gland. But she can talk to raw knowledge and stuff. I'm trying to find them useful because I can generally <coughs> hold a conversation with those experts I've bumped into in the course of my uh, life. The thing is, since becoming a teacher, I've become a counsellor, <coughs> so I deal with a lot of distressed people. And the thing about stress is, it's very closed. People who are in distress, and there's some people in this room who've experienced it, whether it be bereavement or depression or something, Stress, it's, it tends to be quite closed in. You get a very closed in mindset if you separate on a singular particular, something with one in New York, it might be the death of a loved one or so. But it's very isolating and it's very difficult to see your way out of it. And I feel like a lot of people in this situation. And it always occurs to me that actually, if you step back, all the helicopter view, take a big picture, how is your life? What's it add up to at this point? The person who you've lost, did they die well? Did they have a good life? Did it feel right they died at the time? And on this context of it, easing the distress. I'm not saying it takes it away, but easing it. Because being outturned is far more psychologically healthy than being comfortable. And connecting either with people or with things or with the world is just much better for you. And big history is about connecting. It's about openness and it's about knowing the big context of something. And that is very psychologically healthy. So when I come to big history, oh, I really like it because blah, 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 blah. actually, it's just very important to have that kind of mindset. The 
things to be going now and for and it's good to be expert in small things. I don't they're not at all in fact our wives are expert in small things. But also to have that kind of big picture view is very helpful. Why is it for society? The old human being. At the very extreme of human history, there is no gender. There's no race. We are all people. I know we're different when we go down, that's fine. But we start with a commonality of human experience. Human beings are born, they try and make sense of the world, they try and do the best they can with that. Some people succeed tolerably, some people fail miserably. That's the way it is. But if you look at it like that, we are more tolerant of others. Our society will be more pluralistic. Debate will be informed. It will fight against the stereotypes. My mother in law was Czech, my, my first mother in law too. She bangs on about immigrantsy, immigrants. All oh, these immigrants are always doing this, always doing that, always doing this. She lives on her own. She's in the 70s. I scout her every week, talk to young kids. And she can't get away from the stereotype of these immigrants who are ruining her life. They haven't got any immigrants in Czech Republic, they're all in Germany. They don't go see the Czechs because the Czechs don't think it's worth having. But she's got this thing about it, which, you know, stereotype immigrants, they're banging on the door in her head. They're not living. And of course, people who feed into that, Adolf Hitler, noticeably, is the classic example. You don't hear him at all. Big history leads why Leeds. Leeds is great, you know. Leeds is a fantastic historical place. But in two places, the only two cities in England have a name that predates the Romans. One is London. The other one there is there's a Celtic you know, Saxon or Roman. And we fit them on. Farming, industry, that's how we grew massively, moving pretty quickly. It's incredible. The story of Lisa's growth in the 19th century. Ooh, yeah. And then modern means spread culturally, multi ethnic, very vibrant place. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it.
instrument playing at Wickham. Because I'm not sure what what is Yorkshire culture. The theory is that you generalise, but you have to be prepared to accept some changes. But the problem with all this, and it's not new, sociologists have been doing this for years, but the problem with all this is once they've made the generalisations and you give exceptions, or they're just exceptions, this is the trait, and the generalisations, the stereotypes become fixed, no matter how much you look at the past and give them examples. So something like you saying cognitive revolution or some term like that, you said that happens from fans to trads, but it doesn't. You know, people have been using symbolism long before that and all these things, but the, the generalisation fixes and then people won't shift and that's the big danger with it. It is, right. This. So the sort of core of it is to make sure that they don't get stuck in these ideas, because there are interpretations, as you say, we don't really know what was what and when. But they do get yes. stuck <laughs> <That's laughs> in They do, you're right, I know. <laughs> but, so, is that... Does that suggest that then we stop, we just don't bother? Or that we make different generalisations that are more pleasant and more palatable? Which is that Michael Goh's point, when he, when he re tried to rewrite the national curriculum, he said, right, what we need is we need a set of fictions that people like. I suppose a set of fictions that maybe make them comfortable. So, you're right, yeah. But I don't know what Bob says. 